I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Rostin Benham, the acting chairman of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Russ was nominated and approved by the prior administration in 2017 to serve as one of five commissioners of the CFTC, and in January, he accepted the role as acting chairman. The CFTC has a mission to promote the integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of the U.S. derivatives markets, working towards effective price discovery and risk management in fair and transparent markets. As a part of his role, Russ sponsors the CFTC's Market Risk Advisory Committee. Our conversation covers the history, function, and process of the CFTC and the acting chair's path to the seat. We then discuss his perspective on crypto assets and dive into an exhaustive policy piece published last fall by his Market Risk Advisory Committee entitled Managing Climate Risk in the Financial System. The document is positioned to become the leading regulatory policy manual on financial climate risk for the new administration. This conversation took place shortly before Russ rose to acting chairman and before the wild market volatility in recent weeks. We touched base about his perspective, but the situation is too fluid for a public response. Acting Chairman Benham released a brief statement about the silver markets that said, The CFTC is closely monitoring recent activity in the silver markets. The commission is communicating with fellow regulators, the exchanges, and stakeholders to address any potential threats to the integrity of the derivatives markets for silver and remains vigilant in surveilling these markets for fraud and manipulation. Stay tuned, as the subject may well be fodder for another conversation down the road. Today's show is also sponsored by Coinbase Prime, a leading prime brokerage for digital assets. Coinbase provides the bridge to the crypto world for institutional investors, high net worth individuals, financial institutions, and corporate investors through their professional trading platform, deep and diversified liquidity, execution expertise, and Coinbase Custody, one of the largest and most trusted digital asset custodians. For institutions looking to enter the cryptocurrency markets, visit prime.coinbase.com. Please enjoy my conversation with acting CFTC chairman, Rostin Benham. Commissioner Russ, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Ted. It's good to be with you. I think it'd be interesting to start out with just getting a deeper and basic understanding of the CFTC itself. So why don't we start with what the CFTC is. It's one of the two market regulators in Washington. I think probably most of your listeners are more familiar and work with the SEC. But we are the primary derivatives regulator in the US. And we have an interesting history. We're a five-member commission, which is very typical among the commissions in the US. By law, we can't have more than three members of the commission of the same political party. So under a Trump administration, we have three Republicans and two Democrats. I'm one of the two Democrats at the commission. We work very closely together, not only internally, everything. We try for consensus. It's a very collegial atmosphere. And I think that's really the point of the commissions. We're sort of subject matter experts in our space, in the derivative space. And we do whatever we can to work together and get consensus or policy can really run the markets in a fair and transparent way. We also work very closely with our fellow regulators across the city. And the SEC is obviously, like I said, one of the two market regulators, but we work closely also with the prudential regulators, which, again, many of your listeners will know as the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the OCC. So a patchwork of financial regulators, but certainly we work together. We have a lot of the same constituents or registrants, whether it's banks, investors, and others, but we certainly do what we can to work together to make the sort of regulatory process work as smoothly as possible and reduce redundancies and things that I know are challenging for market participants. Markets have evolved over a long time, but CFTC has a pretty unique history. We used to be a part of USDA, a part of the Department of Agriculture until 1975. And as you might think, 
our history is sort of rooted in agriculture and futures products. And this goes back probably to the early 20th century that the CFTC under a different name was a part of USDA. And as markets evolved, specifically in the derivative space from pure agriculture to energy, to currencies, to financials, whether it's interest rates or mortgages, I think Congress in the 70s figured out that this needed to be its own agency with a pretty broad remit and a five member commission. So in 1975, by law, we were spun out. And since then we've been an independent agency. I think it's kind of funny though, but it's probably worth noting and drawing the comparison to the great movie Trading Places, which again, I hope many of you viewers have seen, but this is frozen concentrated orange juice and the trading pits back in the day. And those are our markets, right? They're about price discovery and risk management. They're for end users, for commercial end users, from agricultural products to energies, to commodities across the financial space, interest rates and whatnot. So a lot of tools that affect everyone's life on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's food or fuel or loans, student loans, mortgages, just business loans that the lenders, the financial institutions need to manage the risk of any number of issues, including geopolitical issues. So really important issue. We kind of under the radar, institutional in nature, but something that's really important to our country, the success of the economy and employment and something I really enjoy. It's a great agency. It's a unique group of institutions that participate in the market. And it's really something that I think is important for our country. So you mentioned fair and transparent markets and the importance of that. I'm wondering, what is it you do as a regular regulatory agency to ensure fair and transparent markets? Sure. So we have multiple divisions within the agency, and this is pretty typical in sort of structure. We're unique because of our market, but we have the division of enforcement, which enforces our rules and our laws. We have a division of market participants, and that's in the intermediaries, the brokers. In our world, that's the commodity trading advisors, the pool advisors, the swap dealers, the FCMs, the futures commissions merchants. We have a division of clearing and risk, and they oversee the clearinghouses. Clearing is a huge part of the futures market and has become a huge part of the swaps market as well. And we have the division of market oversight, which oversees the exchanges. And we have two major exchanges, but several other smaller and mid-sized exchanges in the U.S. What we do as the commission is oversee the running of the agency. We oversee the policy. So the Commodity Exchange Act is the law that Congress authorizes our agency and requires us to do certain things to sort of promote fair and transparent markets that actually fulfill the need of price discovery and risk management. But we are constantly changing our rule set and the rules are different than the law. The law is what Congress writes. The rule is what we are authorized to write at the agency level. And again, very typical for an agency. So as a five member commission, we are constantly engaging with market participants, whether it's banks or investors or these intermediaries that introduce these products and trade these futures products or swaps. And we are constantly tinkering and changing our rules to better fit and better suit the current marketplace. Markets are constantly evolving and we have to sort of meet the demands of technology or different infrastructure, the global nature of the markets. And the chairman is one of the commissioners and the chair is appointed by the president. And this is, again, not unusual for commissions. And the chair, his or her agenda really is to run the show at the agency. It's their prerogative to decide what rules they want to think about, what rules they may want to change, what rules they may want to address. And we as a commission and commissioners are very independent. We sort of live in our own little silo and we're free to speak about things favorably or unfavorably, support things or disagree with things, concur on things or dissent. And that really, that friction is what makes, I think, commissions so unique because it's the, the friction of the debate that what we hope comes and results in the best outcome for the markets and the rules. I think the best example of the sort of policymaking at the CFTC relates to what happened in 2008 and the financial crisis. After the financial crisis, which I think many will agree was largely driven by a housing bubble, one of the sort of contributing factors was the over-the-counter swaps market. Following the financial crisis, Congress implemented the Dodd-Frank bill, which was a major Wall Street reform, and one of the titles was swaps reform. So it implemented exchange trading requirements, clearing requirements, reporting requirements, margin and capital requirements for certain types of products. And as a result of that law, which passed in July of 2010, the CFTC and the existing commission at the time had to implement a number of rules 
to follow what Congress had required them to do. So over the course of several years, the commission was really hard at work at drafting rules, proposing them for public comment, taking the public comments, rewriting them, and then finalizing them by a vote. And many were 5-0, some were 4-1, some were 3-2. But overall, there was over like 60 rules that were a result of that law. And now you have 10 years later, a whole new regulatory regime for the swaps market. So that's the process. It's very democratic. It's very important. And I think historically, the commissioners have always engaged with stakeholders across the spectrum, all different types of financial institutions, but also public interest and academics. And we're ultimately trying to shape the best possible rules. We're very flexible, which is very unique. You know, we have different authorities for guidance or no action relief. And these are just little tools that we have to be able to be reactive to the marketplace. And a good example of that is after the COVID really hit in the U.S. in the March-April period, we had a ton of volatility in markets. And we had to react to a lot of different events that were happening in the marketplace, both because we had volatile markets, but people were transitioning to working remotely. So there were so many different regulatory requirements that folks couldn't fulfill. And we just needed to react quickly. And instead of having to go through this long process, we have these tools to react quickly in case things need to get done in a short amount of time. So active, adaptive, quick on our feet if we need to be, but also really driven by transparency and consensus despite the fact that we have differences on certain policies, but ultimately I think it leads to the best possible results for the marketplace. So with five commissioners in the agency, I'm curious, how do you get all this done? Yeah. So we have 700 people at the agency. We're actually split across four different offices. So our main office is obviously in Washington, but we have offices in New York and Chicago and Kansas City. And if you think about, especially the commodities market, the regional offices, which were the ones outside of D.C., were really focused on where the commodity exchanges were. And historically, they were in New York, Chicago, and Kansas City. So our smallest footprint is in Kansas City. Our biggest is in Washington. And then we have a fair number of people in New York and Chicago for obvious reasons. So different divisions, really, really talented people, some that have been at the agency for over 30 years, some who are young and newer to commodities and derivatives. But we split up into these different divisions. The leadership is the commission and ultimately the chair. And we're making the final calls on the sort of executive decisions and operations of the agency and the policy. But from a day-to-day perspective, the nuts and bolts of what's done at the agency is done by the 700 or so people who are committed, dedicated, and really do a good job and know the markets well. Our markets are very complex, obviously. They're very unique and bespoke. It takes many, many years to get a hold on how they function and how they work from the ags to the energies to the financials, but we have really good people and people who are committed and it's a nice place to work and work-life balance that I think incentivizes people to want to have nice long careers here. And we owe it to them above all else because they're the people who do the hard work and really get the job of the agency done. So you mentioned engaging a lot with the constituents in the community, the banks, the financial institutions, money managers. Curious how you do that. There could be a lot of interests and some competing interests among those groups of people. There's huge competing interests. And it's a difficult balance because sometimes we're caught in the situation where I feel like I have to make a commercial decision because two different constituencies can't figure it out amongst themselves. But that's the big challenge of policymaking, right? And I think I have often hear folks talk about either elected officials or regulators or just policymakers generally, and do you have expertise in the subject matter? And certainly that's helpful. But when I think about folks in Washington, I think the number one attribute, the number one thing that I think folks across the country should look to for their elected officials or the regulators that the elected officials appoint is just the ability to listen and to be able to sacrifice time, willingness to take time and listen to someone's point of view and then balance it against the broader selection of other points of view and come up with the best outcome. And that really takes time and commitment, but it's so important because we live in such a big country that is obviously very geographically different, but so many different businesses, so many different vested interests, and that's across the whole economy, let alone financial markets. And to be able to understand and appreciate the commercial interests the business and market interests and sort of dice them up and figure out what's really going to fulfill the mandate of the agency and what I have to do to make sure that markets are fair and transparent and accomplishing their goals, price discovery and risk management. 
how do I balance all those different interests and come out with the best possible outcome? And that's where my colleagues are super helpful too, because we come from different parts of the country. We have different educational backgrounds and work experience, and we're able to, again, work together, discuss these things together and come out with what we think often and more often than not is the best outcome. So it takes a lot of time. I love it. You get to meet people from all across the globe, especially in the derivatives market. But really, in my view, that's the job, right? That's the job is to commit to people, to the registrants, to the taxpayers, that this is what I signed up for gladly and with a lot of pride and, and privilege. And I will do my job the best I can to make sure that I fulfill the mandate of the job and the agency. I want to get to how you got there in a second. But one more question about that fair and transparent markets, which is, if you're listening to the people coming to you, it's not hard to think, well, the people who are more likely to come to you are maybe better resourced, maybe larger. How do you go about balancing the voices of those people with the large number of smaller participants who probably don't find their way into your offices? That's a great question, Ted. And I think we obviously have the largest institutions who have the most resources who can either come in individually or a part of a larger association or group of like-minded institutions. But we have a lot of great public interest representation. You have to lean on academics. There's a lot of great academics across the country who are thinking about things in very different ways from an economic perspective, from a socioeconomic perspective. And then you just have to do your own homework, right? You have to understand what what is the interest of the retail investor? What is the interest of the end user? And that really is for the CFTC, the most important thing. And if you kind of flip that on its head and you think about the SEC, one of their core requirements, obviously, for capital formation is the retail investor making sure there's transparency, making sure there's the free flow of the best information, factual information, so that investors can make the most informed decisions, paraphrasing all of that. But from a derivatives perspective, where we are more institutional in nature, it really comes down to the end user and price discovery and risk management and those markets functioning, markets converging from a futures perspective and understanding that in order to achieve those goals, what's the outcome? The outcome is an end user being able to hedge risk and lay off risk so that they can provide services and continue to do their business so that we see those stable prices across the economy. So how did you end up in this seat? It's been a long little bit of road, but a fun one, different perspectives. Going back a little bit in time, I actually traded. I was on a prop equity desk right out of college, which was both fun, exciting, and really just an educational experience. I was in New York for just over a year, and I graduated college in 2000, so I was downtown. And shortly after 9-11, I left the firm. It was, I think, two or three weeks. And at that point, I had some ideas of going to graduate school. I didn't know when it would happen or where I would go or what discipline I would study. But after 9-11, I decided it was a good time to leave. So left, went to law school in the next fall, um, spent three years up in upstate New York and wasn't totally convinced I wanted to become a lawyer. But after graduating, I spent two years in New Jersey, which is where I grew up at the attorney general's office on focusing on state securities law. So it was the Bureau of Securities. So that was my sort of first touch on official sector, public sector work, and specifically on securities regulation. And after a few years there, I worked at a private law firm in the city for about two, two and a half years. And at that point, I had an interesting conversation with a friend's dad, who's a corporate tax attorney. And I was just seeking advice and, you know, what should I do? How should I be thinking about my career at this point? I was probably in my early 30s. And his unvarnished response was, you got to go work on the Hill. And it was very focused on the law and practicing law, which I think I didn't tell him clearly that I didn't want to necessarily be a lawyer. But he thought, if you want to be a great lawyer, you should go work on the Hill. And I didn't understand it at the time, but it's one of those people in your lives who's very successful and plays a mentor role. So I took the advice without even batting an eye. And I started then to reach out to some of my friends and my network who were still in D.C., and I ended up being very fortunate to land in the United States Senate working for Debbie Stabenow, who's a Michigan Democrat. And this was in the spring of 2011. So it was just under a year after Dodd-Frank had been signed and authorized by President Obama. And at that point, she was just taking over the chairmanship of the Senate Agriculture Committee. And since Dodd-Frank was just passed, she was looking for a financial services, financial regulatory council to help her with implementation of Dodd-Frank specifically for CFTC 
and the agency itself. And again, the history of the agency, we're, we used to be a part of USDA. So on the Hill, you have individual elected official offices, but you also have committee offices and committee staff. And I was her agricultural committee staff. And the agriculture committee on both the House side and the Senate side oversees the CFTC. And by overseeing the CFTC or an agency, that means any laws that come out of Congress flow through that committee. And then any oversight or implementation of the law flows through that committee. The section of Dodd-Frank, which oversaw the swaps reform, came out of the Agriculture Committee. And any oversight that had to occur, occurred out of the Ag Committee. So I spent six years with her, over six years with her, working on CFTC policy, understanding the agency, understanding the politics and the sort of evolution of the agency post-financial crisis. And you also get to vet the nominees. We're going to see this in the next couple of months under a Biden administration where you have new nominees at the cabinet level and below. And these nominees have to go through the Senate for advice and consent, and they will flow through the committee. So while I was working on the committee, I saw commissioners and chairmen, and I helped vet them. So after about five or six years of working in many respects exclusively on CFTC issues and also Dodd-Frank issues, I also got exposure to ag issues and traditional agricultural issues, more of an all-hands-on-deck exercise and environment on the Hill. And that was pretty interesting for me growing up in northern New Jersey, not really understanding production agriculture and really the parts of the country that I'd either never traveled to or you don't get to know people from those different areas and their values and what drives them. And that was a really unique experience. And I have some of my best friends right now are from different parts of the country that I wouldn't have otherwise met if I didn't work on the Hill. And I think that's one of the great things about working on the Hill. And going back to what that original advice was, when you draft laws, the original advice of my friend's dad about you want to be a great lawyer When you have the opportunity, especially on a committee, to draft laws or to be a part of that process, it's not unlike what we were talking about in terms of what I do as a commissioner. You have to engage with constituents. You get and learn about the pros and the cons, the loopholes, the strengths of a law as it's being drafted, the different vested interests of members and elected officials from different parts of the country, different groups, trade groups, individual countries. And you really start to embrace this law like you know it like the back of your hand, but also how it functions, how it's going to be implemented, and what really are going to be the intended and potentially unintended consequences. So as I sort of reflect back now on that advice, having worked in the Senate for six and a half years, it's fantastic advice. You have to be fortunate to land in the right spot, and you have to be fortunate to be a part of major legislation. But if you do have that chance, you really do, as an attorney especially, get a full grasp of how a law functions, how it was drafted, the history, the precedent, and and where it came from. So that was great advice, something that I lean on heavily and also give to younger professionals who might seek out my advice. So after six or so years on the Hill, I spoke with my boss about potentially becoming a commissioner and not an unusual process for senior Senate staff or, or congressional staff to go down to agencies. At that point, after President Trump was elected, started figuring out if there was a possibility in September of 17, after a nomination in August and a confirmation later that month, I was sworn in in September of 17 to be a commissioner. One of the things going on at that time was this sort of massive spike in Bitcoin. And I'm curious, it may still be early days, but how have you thought in your seat about what you might need to do to think about price transparency and risk in digital assets? Yeah, it was a both extremely interesting time, but also an uncertain time because we had this brand new asset, which had been around for years, right? And this goes back to Satoshi in 2009, I think, was when the white paper came out. But obviously, and you point that out, in the fall of 17, we had a major run up in the price of Bitcoin. And it was to reflect back on it now, it touched 20,000. And we were the first real regulator to be, from a government perspective, to touch crypto assets. And there were two reasons. A few years earlier, it had been determined by the agency that Bitcoin is a commodity. And that's something that's pretty unique about the agency, right? The securities laws has a definition for a security, and that's a policy discussion that's going on right now with respect to crypto assets is what constitutes a security or not, and a securities offering. 
But if it's not a security, and if you look up the definition of commodity in the Commodity Exchange Act, there's pretty much everything. Like if it's not a security, it's a commodity. So it naturally sort of fell to us because it wasn't clearly defined as a security. And there was a futures product, two of them actually listed in December of 17. So in the buildup to that, which had taken months, we were engaged pretty heavily with the exchanges and the clearinghouses and the stakeholders and figuring out what are the traditional sort of rigors of our marketplace? How are they going to apply, if at all, to digital assets? And what are the potential outcomes, intended or not? We have to live and breathe by the law, the Commodity Exchange Act. We are not authorized to act outside the scope of the law. We have to interpret it many times, and sometimes those interpretations are right or wrong, easy or hard. But we also have to be flexible and understand that there's going to be new technology emerging constantly, and we have to live within the bounds of the law because Congress does not frequently change the law. It happens periodically. If we have to do something urgently, I think Congress does react. But from a large policy perspective, these things evolve over time. So we looked very carefully at it. For me personally, the most important things were pre-trade price transparency, post-trade transparency and reporting. And then what would constitute the sort of, and I use this word lightly, but trail, right? And from a reporting standpoint, the trail becomes very important of how are we going to identify counterparties? How are we going to identify price in a futures market? The price of the futures contract is being driven by an underlying market, right? So there is many sources for these futures prices in, in different respects, but what was the source for the Bitcoin price? What was driving the futures price? And what was the relationship between the exchange and those those reference prices. And I think those were all things we had to examine carefully. We're still examining them carefully and we're still learning, but it's one of those very difficult situations where I think we want to support innovation. We want to support entrepreneurship. We want to support technology and we just have to walk, but walk slowly, carefully, and understand by working with the sort of ecosystem of constituents that we're going to do this. We're going to do this together. Don't rush us or push us because that I think can be counterproductive, but understand that as a group, we're going to have to work through this slowly so that we get it right. And in the end, if you look at the enforcement cases since then, there's been a number of enforcement cases or fraud and market abuse for sure. And that's natural. That's going to happen, especially in a new market. But certainly our objective is to eliminate that to the maximum extent possible by a strong message from the enforcement division but also working closely with the exchanges, the clearinghouses, and the intermediaries, the participants who are either offering these products. And then from a retail perspective, just educating, making sure people know what they're getting involved with, how they're allocating their capital, and making sure that they're doing their homework before they sign a check or send money away, or Bitcoin in this case. How do you think about this juxtaposition of decentralization, right? The blockchain, in, in theory, perfectly transparent to everyone, and then a regulatory body, which to some extent in Satoshi's white paper is the antithesis of decentralization. It's another good question and something that we're dealing with now because it's decentralized finance, right? We're taking the decentralized institution, whether it's a bank or a regulator in that sense, out of the equation. And I'm sure a lot of the stakeholders would say we've been hitting roadblocks since day one, but I think as the market evolves, and this is an interesting time, and we'll just use Bitcoin as the reference price, but I think you can see correlations across the asset class with the different coins that they've had quite a positive run up. It's a store of value, low interest rate environment. People are looking for safe harbor and Bitcoin is and the other coins have become something of a safe harbor. I'm sure there's a bunch of speculation going on as well that's driving the price up. But we have to be very cognizant of the role that these crypto assets, these digital coins are going to play. And we have to work within the sort of confine of what we have and really send a message to folks that, look, there are a number of different laws, whether it's the Commodity Exchange Act, whether it's the Bank Secrecy Act, whether it's any number of rules and laws that affect consumers, counterparties. There's a lot of reasons why crypto assets can be used for not such savory reasons. There's a lot of reasons why cash can be used for not such savory reasons. But I think if you're going to do business in the U.S., you have to understand that 
we are going to have a regulatory regime that functions and that applies to anything that constitutes or acts like a currency or a store of value. And I think there's a way, I know there's a way to combine these two very opposite forces and lead to a positive outcome, but there's going to have to be flexibility. I mean, if if folks want to completely live in the dark and be away from a regulatory regime or a centralized financial institution, I, I just don't think that functions in the U.S. It's just not going to. That's not the way we function historically, and that's not, I guess, the way we're going to function in the future. So you can probably take that business offshore. But I do think there's a way to balance the benefits of digital currencies and what the blockchain technology really speaks to. And that can be many, many positive things, including banking the sort of underbanked and creating easier venues for people to have access to capital. And just, again, supporting innovation and technology and this potential new wave of of financial services in the future. But we just have to figure out how to mesh the two together so that there's a fair balance between what we have as an existing market and regulatory structure that has served us well, by and large, very, very well. It is why we are the strongest economy in the world, which is why we have the deepest and the best capital markets and also the the best derivatives markets in the world, because we have fair, transparent rules and laws that oversee these markets. So I'd like to dive into another example of work that you've done that certainly came to fruition in a, I don't know, 200-page report on sustainability. And maybe we start with how does the notion of climate risk fall its way into your lap and turn into a very substantial report? A lot of it has to do with what I did in my previous time in the Senate, for sure. And then before that, as a trader and as an attorney. And I, when I was at the commission in September of 17, you're kind of getting your feet wet. You're figuring out what you want to do. You have to develop relationships with your colleagues, get to know the agency and the one that you're going to be part of this sort of executive team. And then as time goes by, you want to start to think about what your priorities are going to be. To an extent, this is kind of corny, but like what your legacy is going to be, what you want to leave the agency being known for. And Climate change has been an issue that's been growing in this country for a number of years. I think it's fair to say that even in the past couple of years, the interest, I think, from a large portion of the country and the populace has grown and spiked. In the financial circles, sustainability, ESG, has grown exponentially, both from a retail perspective, but I think just from a what is this and what can it do for resolving and mitigating climate change. And I started reading and just getting to know what potentially the relationships were. The CFTC is like a great landing spot, right? Historically, we are a market that helps mitigate, in many respects, climate risk. It's certainly commercial risk for a farmer or rancher to be able to know that someone's going to be able to buy their harvest at the end of the season. But ultimately, if you're going to start planting seed in March or April, you're laying off price risk because you don't know what your growing season is going to be like. So we've historically kind of done this in this respect of climate change. It's now just on a different scope and scale. So I think the CFTC is actually a nice place to have this exercise. But I was really kind of mixing a lot of my different expertise and then seeing what other folks were doing overseas. And a lot of central banks and different organizations had been thinking about climate financial risk and what the relationship is and what we needed to do, I think, as a group, both from the regulatory public sector standpoint and the private sector standpoint to address the risk. We have advisory committees at the CFTC and each of the commissioners oversees an advisory committee. Advisory committees are not unique to the CFTC. Many agencies have them. They are great tools. They are authorized by Congress in law. And what they really are is an an opportunity for the policymaker or the individuals who oversee the agency to convene groups of private stakeholders, and really just have a discussion and let the advisory committee advise the agency on what the agency is doing right or wrong or how it can think about different issues from a regulatory standpoint. Really gives us an opportunity to see what's going on in the marketplace today so that we can adapt and adjust as the markets themselves evolve. I oversee one of the five advisory committees, the Market Risk Advisory Committee, And as much as we are siloed and sort of run our own shop, which I pointed to earlier, the chair, the chairman or chairwoman runs the agency agenda. So the advisory committees give the 
Commissioner is really a great tool to elevate issues that they care about individually and really carve out their own path and niche as a commissioner. So as time went by, I started talking about LIBOR transition, which I'm sure many of your listeners are aware of and working towards. Clearinghouse risk is a huge issue in our space, given the clearing mandate after Dodd-Frank. So still sort of doing what I believe is baseline work that needs to get done, but also thinking ahead, why don't we sort of dive into climate risk and see what I can do within the context of the advisory committee to have a conversation among stakeholders. So I would say back in 18, I started putting ideas together, understanding the risks themselves of doing this, right? You know, it's not necessarily a friendly environment currently to have a discussion about climate change. I'm working in the administration, trying to do my job, but also trying to raise awareness about risks that I see. So I had to be very strategic and thoughtful about how I would conduct this and how I would execute it, knowing that my ultimate goal was to get a report out and some sort of policy document that would help inform policymakers and their decisions. So as time went by in June of 19, I had a public meeting, which again is not unusual for an advisory committee. So I basically convened a bunch of stakeholders and we had some great representatives from academia and investors and exchanges and some public interest. And we just had a discussion and this effort was just an exercise in laying the groundwork for what would come down the road. And we had a very thoughtful conversation for a couple hours and the private market basically tell us, the regulator, that this is a real risk. We've been thinking about this risk very carefully. And we think that there's a collaborative outcome where we need to come up with policies to help mitigate the risk and help transition to a net zero economy. So after that meeting, I then put out a public notice and asked folks to volunteer their time to be a part of a subcommittee of my larger advisory committee to examine climate-related financial market risk. And I think I had a 60-day comment period where folks could submit invitations or names to be a part of the committee. And I was certainly a little worried and also anxious and like uncertain of who would participate given, again, the political environment, the topic. Would anyone participate? I had to make a lot of phone calls to get people sort of a clear vision of what I wanted to do and intended to do. And in the end, after those 60 days, which brought us to September of 19, we had 90 applicants. But I can tell you from personal experience for an advisory committee, that's like a ton of applicants. You may get a couple dozen or three dozen at most. Many are located in Washington and they're great, but they're typically the reps of the companies who are in DC and want to message the sort of issues from the headquarters. But in this case, we got chief risk officers, we got the commercials, We got folks from across the world and we got a lot of them and they wanted to be a part of this effort. And I think they were excited about it. They saw the value in it and they had done so much work themselves that they wanted to share that work and really demonstrate to a larger audience what they view as major risks for the U.S. financial system, what they've been doing and how they can contribute to the conversation. So that in of itself was just a validation of my effort and a validation that this was an important issue that we needed to discuss at a federal level. So at that point, I started to select a number of the committee members over the next, I think, month or so before we kicked it off officially. In the prior administration, which clearly wasn't so favorable to even the science of climate change, did you need to depoliticize the science Because the risk might be present whether or not you believe in the science. Yes, 100%. And it's one of the key strategies I had because something I say pretty often is that I've been asked, why are you doing this? Like, why do you think this is your job? And I have a very clear answer why I think this. I mean, I'm a market regulator. I have to, I do my job on a day to day basis, but I'm also having to constantly think about future risks of financial markets. Like my job is not to just reflect on past risk and think how another housing crisis might cause a meltdown or how a sovereign wealth fund might go down and cause ripples across the globe. My job is to think about future risks and what we have to anticipate from a policy perspective and how we can build a more resilient system. So The easiest way for me to do this was just to use examples of climate events. And the unfortunate reality, and this is what I say all the time, is that these climate events keep happening in a more extreme, more frequent manner, such that it 
really is not hard to connect the dots about what future climate events caused by climate change will result in for both our economy and financial markets. And we don't have to get into a discussion of why this climate is changing. Let's just look at what's going on. And for the past several years, you've had record flooding in the Midwest. You have hurricane seasons in the Gulf Coast. And then obviously, to speak about the forest fires in the West Coast. And there are so many different reasons why these are happening from a biodiversity standpoint, from a population standpoint. But the bottom line is that climate events and climate patterns are changing. And we can have this discussion as a civilian why I think it because of carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. But the bottom line is we're seeing these events on TV, in social media. We're seeing how it's affecting micro economies, regions and communities and what the outcomes are. And there's this term in the report, subsystemic, and I love it because it's kind of a coined phrase that, yeah, you know, is it fair to say that climate change currently is going to cause financial stability or a financial crisis? No, not at the time. But if we have to think about climate change going forward for decades, and when you have these micro shocks across the country, which I think you could credibly say with what happened in the West Coast and what happens in the Gulf Coast, just as a matter of timing and compounding events happening across the country with these weather events that you can see larger risks happening at the regional level and then raising up to the national level. So I definitely reframed it. I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to talk about why the climate is changing and what patterns we're seeing from a scientist perspective. I'm the first to admit that, but I'm just going to observe climate events and make a correlation and a connection between those climate events the economy, and then ultimately what matters to me is financial market risk. So as you went through this whole process and came out with this report, why don't we walk through some of that? And I guess first frame out, what are those key issues from your lens as the commissioner? How did you define what the issues are? Yeah. So there was a few things that I thought about very carefully in mapping out the plan and the vision for the report. The first thing and the most important thing was getting the right people. In the end, out of those 90 or so applicants that we got, we signed up 34. In 34, we have large, both domestic and international banks. We have institutional and some smaller investors representing, I think, over six or seven trillion dollars of AUM. We have exchanges, we have intermediaries, data providers, we have agricultural end users, agricultural companies, energy companies, large oil and gas companies, academics, public interest, we have environmental groups. So broad spectrum of the economy, certainly a broad spectrum of financial markets and the sort of financial market ecosystem. And in my view, policymaking 101, right? How do you get something done? How do you work through roadblocks? How do you work through friction and barriers? It's just to build the most diverse coalition possible. How do we get as many people from different perspectives agreeing on something and saying, this is important. This is a challenge. Government and policy needs to step in and be a part of this conversation. Testament to the members and their willingness to participate. But that was a huge, huge victory to be able to get this coalition together and agree ultimately to a report that's both long and comprehensive, but unanimously, 34 to zero, which is, it's just awesome. The other thing was the chairman, Bob Litterman, You've observed this with these advisory. I mean, this is no different than running a large Fortune 100 corporation. You need great leadership. And Bob, I think he's been on your show, is just, he was the perfect mixture of leadership because of his experience at Goldman, because of his academic credentials and his education as an economist, both as a risk manager, as an investor, as an economist, and then most recently in the past 10 or so years, as someone who's just been dedicated to climate change. And Bob's number one priority is carbon pricing and the allocation of capital based on incentives. Having him at the helm to lead the committee was really fantastic. So we got the group together. I mapped out a very broad remit for the committee. So certainly, like I've said, CFTC, derivatives, regulator, but no one's been doing this in the U.S., some work has been done at the Fed, especially at the regional level, to talk about climate risk. But I thought since this sort of road is wide open, let's do a broad, comprehensive review. We have the right people together. We have the right institutional knowledge. 
let's do a comprehensive look at both every element of risk that can be affected by climate change. And in the end, the report talks about any number of things from disclosures, which is very common in the public reporting space regulated by the SEC, stress testing financial institutions, which would be more for prudential and supervisory out of the central banks or the bank regulators, data and taxonomy. How do we work together both domestically and internationally? And this goes to the ESG question and conundrum. What are we reading? What does this mean? And what am I comparing it to? And what information do I have to digest so that I can make the most informed decision as either an investor or a portfolio manager or a CIO? So these risks sort of flow across the economy. You're seeing these events happening, like I said, across the country, across the globe. How is it going to affect asset prices? How is it going to affect valuations of commercial property, of infrastructure, of any hard asset that has financing behind it? And what does that mean for regional institutions, national institutions, and how can that ripple across the economy? And I think looking at all of these issues and the potential outcomes, the report does a really good job of trying to solve to the extent possible all the challenges that we might face and what policies could help to mitigate those issues. You touch on a couple of, of key things and maybe disclosure and taxonomy go together. There's always this question of it's great to say we should have disclosure about emissions, whatever the case may be. It's a whole nother thing trying to figure out consistency in what gets measured. What did you conclude are the next steps that should be taken? So you're right. I said this recently. I say it often, but disclosures, I think if you ask sample set of people, what do they think about when they think about climate change and financial markets? Disclosures would probably be the first thing. And in my view, it's information. It's the research analyst. It's the portfolio manager being able to make the most informed decision. But on the other hand, and I think this is where you're going, it's like, what's the context of that disclosure? What's the metrics that we're measuring different issues uh, by? And how are we supposed to really trust this information to be accurate and comparable and reliable? And interestingly, that discussion was probably the hardest, but I think the most rewarding at the advisory committee level, because it is one of the most difficult ones from a policy perspective. There's a very clear standard right now for public reporting companies that you have to disclose material risk. And you could see on one side of the debate how someone might argue, look, material risk is an umbrella term. If you're the compliance officer, if you're in-house counsel, if you're outhouse counsel, whoever's putting those documents together, the Qs and the Ks, it says material risk. We will evaluate what constitutes material risk. If it's climate or otherwise, we will put it in the report. On the other hand, material risk is very generic. It's very principles-based. Climate risk is very unique as compared to traditional financial market risk. It's not linear in the sense that it's predictable and that you can rely on past quarters or past performance to predict future outcomes. It is a lot of unknowns, and we need to be a little bit more prescriptive in what constitutes material climate risk so that that in-house counsel or that compliance officer has a clear understanding of what needs to be disclosed. And you can see the difficulty there because what constitutes climate risk to one compliance officer might not constitute climate risk to another. So you might have very different lenses and views of what constitutes climate risk. And then if you're a portfolio manager, you're looking at companies that are correlated in the same industries and you don't have the same risk metrics. And then you're like, okay, where did this come from? So I think that's the issue. That's kind of the camp I fall in. But certainly we have to be careful about how we do it. And this is this unique intersection of environmental science and financial markets so that we can have the right outcomes, that we can see what potential patterns we have in the future and measure them accordingly so that compliance councils can evaluate and be transparent in what constitutes risk so that, again, investors can make these decisions in the most informed way possible. So the concept of that is sort of incontrovertible. It'd be nice if we could all have a consistent way of looking at this, measuring it, and reporting it. Were you able to make recommendations as of yet as to exactly what those should be? So the specifics, no. That's going to take a long time. Not years, but what the recommendation was in the space of disclosures was that with some caveats, not every, you know, everyone agreed that need to rethink disclosures. And I think the consensus unanimous decision was 
the current standard is it's like guidance around climate risk at the SEC. And the recommendation is that there needs to be mandatory disclosure of climate risk that is clear, reliable, and fair. And I'm paraphrasing, so I'm probably missing a few things. But essentially, the bottom line is that we need to up our ante and we need to either rewrite the rule or affirm the guidance and be more clear for the public and the investor community what constitutes climate risk. The work that will go into that, I think, will be the very difficult work in sort of potentially drafting a rule, engaging with the public, or clarifying what constitutes climate risk above and beyond that umbrella term material risk. So it would have taken a long time to do that. But I think the number one goal was to just sort of clarify where we would fall on that line. And the committee clearly fell on the side of disclosing in a mandatory fashion to climate risks. So as you follow on from that, this notion of a stress test makes a lot of sense. How do you go about that without the sort of common metrics of what would go in the inputs to the stress test? Yeah. I mean, it's another huge challenge. All of this all goes back to data and data is one of the hugest and biggest challenges for climate change, right? Across the board. And I would say that the biggest takeaways from the exercise at the advisory committee with respect to stress testing, because you're right, it does make sense. Why wouldn't you evaluate the resiliency of these financial institutions as they face these climate events? But it has to be a consistent, and not only does it have to be consistent domestically, it's got to be consistently internationally. So there's been a number of efforts overseas, one that some of your listeners may know of the Network for Green and the Financial System, and that's being housed out of the Banque de France, the French Central Bank. And many of the recommendations, and this was an interesting observation from my perspective, was that the committee was committed to making sure that whatever recommendations they had, specifically in the stress testing space, that it was consistent with international conclusions. So that we, although we have different particular metrics with which we stress test institutions for traditional financial stress in the U.S., those would be relevant, but the more important thing would be to make sure that we coordinate and do it on a consistent basis internationally. So ultimately, it's data points. It's being able to observe. And this is the opposing view is legitimate in the sense of how are you supposed to predict future scenarios? Climate change, like I said, is not linear. How are we supposed to understand and appreciate different scenarios of different potential climate events or temperature changes over the next few decades? But we just have to build into different methodologies, different data points, and come up with a standardized, reliable, consistent set of scenarios so that then each of the institutions can stress against that same thing so that something is uniform across the board. What were some of the other most important conclusions of the work? Number one recommendation was carbon price. I think for a group as diverse as the committee was for them all to agree that you need a price on carbon. And we talked about this a little bit earlier with Bob and the economic point of view is creating incentives, right? The incentives are not in the right place so that the capital is not flowing in the right area. And we, we can have this debate about how we're going to mitigate and tackle climate change. But for those who strongly believe in a carbon price, how are we going to really start to move the needle on this discussion is you have to put a price on carbon, right? It's an externality right now. It's free essentially, right? If there's no cost to emitting, there's no incentive to stop or reduce emissions. So that was, especially with oil and gas companies, and you're seeing this across the board, the Baker Schultz model has a number of oil and gas companies, a number of large corporations have committed to, or at least advocated for a carbon price. But to get this group to agree to that, that was pretty remarkable and I think a strong statement. The other things, which my takeaway is you have this diverse group of economic stakeholders from academics to private companies. And in this day and age, I think where the conversation about climate change and ESG and sustainable finance is really evolving so much and so rapidly, just to get, I think, the public aware of where many large institutions, academics, and public interest groups are thinking and consistently sends a really strong message. And we have a lot of folks in elected office who care deeply about this issue. We have some who are on the fence and we have some who are just not there and that's fine. My goal was to get certainly at the starting point, people on the fence, and then just to educate to an extent that it's possible and inform and see what these constituents are doing. Because 
we talked about what I view my most important job is to listen. And it's like, I'm appointed. I get that. I know that more than anyone else, but I have a responsibility to listen to my stakeholders. And I think when you see folks in your district or your constituency speaking to you in a uniform, strong voice, then I think it requires action. I'm hopeful that this document will result in action. So we have a new administration coming in. What do you think happens from here? On a more specific level, I haven't spoken to anyone in President-elect Biden's camp about the report, but from public documents, they've actually, in their larger climate policy papers, the one thing in the sort of sustainable finance or climate risk space that they've called for is mandatory disclosures for public reporting companies. So my suspicion is whoever is nominated or potentially in the queue for a SEC chairmanship, this will be a priority for the administration. Everything else kind of falls in line. I think to an extent we discussed how as much of all these sort of policy recommendations are unique in their own way, they're all sort of connected. You've seen a lot of work by the Federal Reserve just in the past couple of weeks and advancements in their view on climate change, and they've been doing it for a number of years. So I think that will only continue to snowball. And then most importantly, and you've seen this from the Biden folks, they view climate as an all of government exercise. So regardless of what specific policy data points or talking points they've issued, that larger statement gives a lot of context to, I think, the way they're going to view climate change in the financial services space. And this document, the greatest thing about this document, it's 200 pages. The bulk of it is about risk. And we have to think about that. We have to think about what risk it poses to the economy, what risk it poses to financial markets. COVID, perfect example. When I first started this exercise, I talked to economists, I talked to folks who have been around financial markets and financial regulatory groups for years, and they weren't bought into the climate change, financial stability, financial resilience argument. And I think now it's becoming more real because of COVID. And I've said this a couple of times. I'm like, I wonder if you asked folks in our world 10 or 15 years ago, what would the correlation or relationship be between a health crisis, a health pandemic, and financial market resiliency and stability? And I bet you a lot would not draw a connection, but we saw what happened in March and April. We saw what reaction and intervention we needed by central banks from a monetary policy standpoint. We see to this day what fiscal policy we need to sustain the economy. We saw some really, really unprecedented things in financial markets, dislocations in prices, just draining of liquidity, and it's worrisome. And it was because of a health crisis. And I think climate crisis, climate change poses those same risks. So I think this all of government idea by the president elect will require a rethinking about climate change and how it relates to financial markets, but also the opportunities. And, and this is my point is this, the, the end of the report, the final chapter is awesome because it really identifies the opportunities. And I think your investors see that, right? It's the, the growth of the ESG portfolio and asset class. And what I think we've seen so far is just the tip of the iceberg. I think it's going to just continue to grow. There's going to be retail demand, but there's going to be institutional demand. And I think there's a strong role for the government to play in sort of supporting that, developing and supporting a structure because we have all the right incentives together. The incentives are aligned. We want to take on climate change and we want to mitigate those risks and we want to solve the problem. And I think when those interests are aligned from an official public sector standpoint and a private sector standpoint, we can work together in a way that's really going to both benefit the climate challenge, but also the opportunities of capital appreciation, formation, and just better returns. So what's next for you and your work in the commission? So my term ends in June of 2021. So we'll work through the year and see what happens. And I'll continue talking about climate risk and live or certainly, but I love doing these events, listening to you. And I thought my number one objective since the report came out in September was to raise awareness to as many different groups as possible to draw those relationships between financial markets and climate change and to seize on the opportunities. If you make it this far each week, you're probably ready for the closing questions. But wait, there's more. If you sign up for a premium membership, you can access our premium feed which includes an additional set of closing questions each week and removes all the ads from the show, including this little pitch to subscribe. Hop onto the website to sign up. Thanks, and let's get on with it.
Okay. Well, Commissioner Russ, I can't quite let you go without asking a few closing questions. There is this lexicon and government that I and everyone else is supposed to refer to you as Commissioner Rustin or Commissioner Russ. I've been watching The Crown and it feels a little bit parliamentary. So what, what is the genesis of the phrasing of the appropriate language to use? For me, why we do it, I mean, it's, I go by Commissioner Benham. It feels odd to me. It certainly felt odd to me at the outset because I go by Russ. I've been, that's my name, my friends, my family. <laughs> so it's a little weird. And a lot of people ask me, it's like, what do you want me to call you? But I feel like there's an institutional demand to call individuals who have been appointed by the president of the United States and confirmed by the Senate that this is their title. And it's no different than calling a judge by a judge, you know, it's judge, whatever, right? It's that formality. And in many respects, it's what makes our country great. We have these structures in place that demand a level, I think, of respect in many senses, but also of authority that I think gives us the clear lens that we need. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and my wife and I are expecting a third baby soon. So I don't have hobbies. I don't have time to have hobbies. So what I do do for my mental health is I run a lot and I've always run a lot. So I don't know if that constitutes a hobby, but it is something that I am passionate about. And it's the 90 minutes of my day that I'm allowed to just unwind, think to myself, I don't listen to music. I just run and reflect. What's your most important daily habit? My most important daily habit is waking up in the morning, making breakfast for my girls, and just putting music on really loud, quite frankly. They like it. They like to dance. And it just kind of gets me into a nice mood for the day. That was great. What's your biggest pet peeve? Pet peeve. So a simple one or a fun one. I've been doing a lot of grocery shopping during the pandemic, and we all want to be efficient, keep our distance from each other. And when you get into a grocery line and I see folks ahead of me not packing bags and just letting the cash attendant pack bags, that drives me nuts because I think we could just be a lot quicker and just move things along. But that's my basic pet peeve. But something that I think about these days a lot, the internet and technology has democratized our ability to write and share our views, which I think is a great thing, and the privileges that we have under the First Amendment. But in these very divisive times where we have a lot of different points of view, I get articles sent to me or notes sent to me from friends or family. And I read an article and I'm like, did you not unpack this a few layers? I wish people would just unpack things a little bit more and not just take things for their face because you have to look about who wrote it, why they wrote it, and what's driving it. And I think if we did that a little bit more as a country, we could understand each other better, and I think it would lead to better outcomes. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Patience. My dad and my mom, for sure, they were very patient people. And I think the way I conduct myself, whether in work or in life, you might not always get what you want out the gate, but I think just understanding that good things will happen to good people. You take your time, you let things happen in their natural course, and things will take care of them themselves. And I think that's something I try to even teach my kids right now from a very early age. Right. All right, Russ, last one, and then I'll ask you a couple more for our premium members. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? Ask questions. I think that's a part of my job now more so than ever, and I think I've gotten better at it. But I think when you're young, whether you're in high school or college or even in your 20s, you don't ask questions, or I didn't, but I wish I had asked more questions, almost annoyingly asked questions, because that's the best way to, to learn and to help define yourself and who the person you're going to be is in the future. Terrific. Well, thanks so much. It's really, really interesting. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time.